You are welcome to this brief preview of the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, intended for those who lead men's Bible discussion groups. We are reading from the New Revised Standard Version of 2022. In a Bible discussion group, you will read the scripture and allow anyone to make comments, observations, or to pose queries. After others have raised their concerns, then you too can pose queries or make comments about the text. This epistle was written by the Apostle Paul during his second missionary journey after his visit to Thessalonica. He probably wrote this from the city of Corinth. During this lesson, participants will try to find out how to begin leading a life that pleases God. And secondly, what will happen to us when Jesus returns? Try to situate the discussion of this passage in some kind of analysis of the entire book. Here we follow a semantic structure adapted from the work of Robert Stirner. The book begins with a greeting and then an expression of thanks to God for the Thessalonians' faith, love, and hope. God wants them to remain pure and to do good. Paul explains, you learned this from our instruction. God wants you to be holy now and at his coming. This includes moral and ethical purity. It includes hope of being raised back to life. Thus, the apostles appeal to them to keep doing good as a body, then praying, May the God of peace sanctify you entirely, followed by a closing greeting. You learned this from our instruction. Have someone read aloud in your group verses 1 and 2. Listen to their comments and observations and try to reply to their queries. Explain that the term finally is just an adjective meaning remaining, used as a kind of adverb. In Paul's writing, he makes use of doublets, or what are called in Greek a hendiades, when he uses two nouns for a singular idea or two verbs for a singular action. So how would you translate the phrase to live and to please God? perhaps to please God by the way in which you live. You might discuss, is it possible for human beings to live in ways that please God? Or are we too sinful? What can we infer about Christian maturity from the phrase, do so more and more? Is there room for growth? Where can we find instruction on how to live in ways to please God. Remember, God wants you to be holy now and at his coming. This includes moral purity and mutual love. Therefore, you must abstain from sexual immorality. Have someone read aloud verses 3 through the first half of verse 5. After discussing it, explain that the term sanctification is the same word in the original as holiness, a noun form of holy or saint, meaning that which belongs to God. The phrase in holiness, is holiness a means of gaining self-control? Or is holiness the result of being self-controlled? Here's another Hendiades. How would you translate in holiness and honor? Discuss what is the will of God. Explain that this phrase has several usages in both the First and New Testaments. It sometimes refers to God's eternal decrees, that which he absolutely will do, even though this is unknown to humans. It can refer to God's foreordained glory for us believers. It includes the Noahide laws, the expressed will of God for human beings before Moses began writing the Pentateuch, or the First Testament. Much of God's will 
is very clearly revealed in the Tanakh, that is to say, the Law, Psalms, and Prophets of the Hebrew Bible. Jesus made God's will very clear when he commanded, Go make disciples of Gentiles everywhere. The will of God includes Christian behavioral standards, and it is a privilege of every Christian who wants to do God's will to enjoy divine guidance in their service for his name. Still, from these verses, discuss what is a basic test of whether someone knows God, and what should we do when we or someone else get caught up in adultery or some other form of immorality? Have someone read aloud verse 6. Try to retranslate the Hendiades or the doublet to wrong and to exploit. Maybe to do wrong by exploiting? The old King James Version referred to defrauding one another. So, in what ways can someone defraud another in these things, that is, in matters of morality? Remember, to defraud someone is to offer them something that you have no right to give or to take. And then, what is the place of holy fear in our walk with the Lord Jesus? Put another way, in what ways does God take vengeance on Christians who indulge in immorality? He always does. And what is the place of warnings in Christian evangelism? What is the place of repentance in Christian conversion? What do we seek to leave as we turn to Jesus in faith? Read aloud verses 7 and 8. Explain that the phrase, to impurity, may mean God's purpose, which is not to keep you impure. Or, is this an expression of cause? God called you because you were impure. Or the basis of his call, to let you stay impure? And the phrase, in holiness. Was it God's purpose to make you holy? Or is holiness the result? He made you holy. Verse 8 begins with a very strong inference, which could be translated, consequently. Warn against rejecting the will of God. The Greek verb means to reject something as invalid, to declare it invalid, to nullify it, or just ignore it. Secondly, to reject not by recognizing something or someone. Hence, to reject, not recognize, to disallow. It's very serious. In contrast, what kind of power does God give to every Christian to lead a chaste or moral life? Remember, we are to love one another. Have someone read verses 9 and 10 aloud. After discussing the text, you might ask, By what means does God teach us to love? After listening to replies, you might summarize as follows. He taught us in the law, when he said, You shall love your neighbor. Jesus commanded us that we love one another, and the fruit of his Holy Spirit is first love. Then there are biblical examples to lay down one's life for his friends, for example. God may begin to teach us to love even through our pagan background. Lao Tzu said, Being deeply loved by someone gives you strength, whilst loving someone deeply gives you courage. Verses 10, 11, and 12 should be read aloud. You might lead a discussion on the distinction between a biblical work ethic versus cultural norms. For example, Christians are to live quietly, whereas pagans are always demanding their rights. We are to mind our own affairs, whereas others meddle and accuse. We are willing to work with our hands or our mind. Others prefer to invest or to incur debt. We are at all times to behave properly, whereas pagans defraud each other. This allows us to remain self-sufficient. 
whereas the lazy prefer to depend on others. Remember, God wants you to be holy now and at His coming. This includes hope of resurrection at the Lord's coming. Read aloud verses 13 and 14. After discussing the passage, you might ask, From this passage, what is the content of Christian hope? Then listen to the replies, and have someone read aloud verse 14. If necessary, explain that this sentence contains what is called a first-class condition, which is assumed to be true. If you have intelligent participants, they want to know that this is the premise of a syllogism. So, you might ask, what is the logic of this passage? What does it mean, if this, then what? Will God not bring back Jesus if we do not believe it? That cannot be the meaning. Maybe it is as follows. Jesus died and rose. God will bring him back. God will bring back dead believers with him. And since we believe this, God will bring back our dead ones as well. And if we shall have died, then he will bring us back too. Have someone read aloud verses 15 and 16. Have them identify three audible signals that announce Jesus' return, noting that there will be no secret rapture. First, there is Jesus' own cry of command. Perhaps he will say, You dead, rise back to life. And then the archangel with him will call, perhaps to the angels, You holy ones, let us go to earth. Then there will be God's own trumpet sound, perhaps when he announces to the world, You wicked, you lose. Read aloud verses 17 and 18, and propose a brief exercise for the group. Let them form groups of two or three individuals. Have them read verses 14 through 17 to identify the coming events, and then list these on paper in chronological order. If they have no paper, they will be able to do so by memory. And then, if they have pen and paper, let each group sketch a chart of those events, reminding them that there will be more material to add to their chart from chapter 5. You can then take a photo of each of the images. Announce the next lesson, which will show how to fit these coming events into a biblical times and seasons framework with a brief preview of the structure of the remaining chapters of the book, how God wants you to be holy now and at his coming. This includes hope of resurrection at the Lord's coming, in the day of the Lord, to obtain salvation from the coming wrath, and how we appeal to you to keep doing good as a body. So may the God of peace sanctify you entirely.